Joining us to continue the discussion on pro-life efforts in Africa is Obianuju Ekocha, founder and president of Culture of Life Africa, an initiative dedicated to the promotion of the gospel of life in Africa. Obianuju, you talk about ideological colonization. We just heard about that in our package in your pro-life work. Tell us more about what that means, this push for abortion in Africa. Yeah, so uh, it's um, it's quite a phenomenon and, and quite surprising because this is the age, age of information and most things happening. We have witnesses around the world with social media, but no one seems to be talking about it. That Western countries, especially uh, the countries that are donor, the so-called donor nations to African nations, those who give them money, those who give them funding and aid, humanitarian aid, and even sometimes like private citizens and private foundations like the Gates Foundation, they come to African countries to offer some help, supposedly, but then they also have their own demands and their own uh, requests. And most times uh, it is it, it would have to do with ideology and, and cultural and especially things that have to do with pushing abortion, pushing contraception, population control, and things like that. So it's a kind of a, a carrot and stick uh, technique which the Western uh, donors use to, for, to approach African countries. And it's really frustrating. A carrot and stick approach that's really interesting. A lot of money is funneled into Africa, like you were saying, for reproductive health rights from wealthy donors in the West. The COVID-19 pandemic then brought even more funds to Africa and to countries around the world. Has there been an increase in this push for contraceptive and abortion funding as well? Oh, most definitely, especially because during the time of the COVID pandemic, if anyone would remember, most people around the world were rightly so concerned about what was happening in their own countries, the shutdowns, the limitations, the loss of freedoms and the loss of businesses and so on and so forth that was happening in countries. So no one was really looking at what was happening between Africa and those nations, again, and those donors, those entities that are come in with their own demands. But then what happened under the kind of protection of the darkness of COVID era was that the abortion organizations used it to gain a lot of grounds. They were pushing for more, uh, for more activism on abortion. And it's very ironic because during the COVID pandemic, we were supposedly indoors. So it was incredible to see more push for abortion laws uh, or abortion legalization through African countries. There was more push for uh, all kinds of res resolutions at the United Nations level. Uh, we saw a lot of that. And I think they used the fact that no one was really paying attention mm. to push so much more that abortion should be brought in as a kind of international right. Obi Anuju, you're from Nigeria, a very pro-life country that took the lead in defending the unborn at the United Nations just a couple of weeks ago. But we see That's a right. lot of religious persecution there, too, especially of Christians and Catholics. Is the Catholic Church very involved in the pro-life movement there, or is it not safe enough to be doing that? Okay, so I've been doing pro-life work now, so I'd say for the last decade or so, very actively. And I would say that uh, at the beginning of my pro-life uh, activism, in a sense of speaking, there was so much that was done around Nigeria. There were many uh, places where, for example, pro-life conferences, uh, Match for Life campaigns were done back in 2015, 2016. We had, we had and we saw so many activities around the country. But since things have been... Um, uh, very difficult in my country, I'd say it's been much harder for bishops and for people within the Catholic Church in Nigeria to be able to pay attention to do pro-life uh, activities. And you can say that, you know, people are still afraid of their lives. There's so much insecurity, more than we've ever seen it in my own lifetime, that people feel so unsafe that they can't even come out for regular things, or people are afraid to come out for regular things. What more this extra activity? So mm. it's been very, it's been there's been a hard hit on pro-life activities and pro-life efforts around the country, but still the Nigerian people are still very pro-life and still value human life. And I think even now, maybe recognize so much more like the value of every human life, every human life. That's exactly right. So these shared values on the pro-life issue in Nigeria, could they potentially be a model for bridge building between various tribes or religions, bringing people together under this one umbrella? 
we had that before. It was quite easy for me to work, for example, with a lot of our Muslim politicians, with a lot of our Muslim delegates at the UN. It didn't matter whether one was Christian or Muslim. We, I knew that when I was talking to a Nigerian, I was talking to a pro-life person. Mm. So we've already had that. And, and we had, you know, we had great success in, in trying to use pro-life work to get through and get across to people, irrespective of whatever anyone believes. But, you know, we all believe that every life should be protected. So at this time, I think it's something that is still there, kind of in the background, but it's one that we need to re-emphasize and keep re-emphasizing that no matter what is happening, we still have this, at least these common grounds where we know for sure that we have the same beliefs and the same passions, which, it, which would have to do with protecting human life at every cost. That's right. And in protecting human life, for a lot of people, maternal uh, mortality is something that they think about often. Sub-Saharan Africa has some of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. Yes. And many pro-abortion advocates then believe that the answer is more access to contraceptives and more access to abortion. What is your response to that? What's that pro-life solution there? It's very unfortunate because I myself, I have, of course, been born and raised in Africa, uh, in Nigeria particularly, but I have lived for the last almost 20 years in Europe. And I know that what our ideological or ideologue um, donors are not offering us is what they have in Europe and America. It's the excellent medical facility, the excellent medical care. What is it that has made women's lives much better here in Europe? It's not abortion. It's not even contraception. It's the fact that they have top-notch uh, medical services. They're, you know, they're, they're doing everything they can to improve the medical services. They continue to improve. But they're not offering us any of this and they're telling us this approach, you know, giving abortion, giving contraception, perception is what you need in order to reduce maternal mortality. And that is a blatant lie. I've worked within the healthcare system here in the United Kingdom. And I know for a fact that uh, what we need in Africa and what is making a difference here in Europe, it's not abortion. It's all the things that they're not offering us, which is really, you know, all the excellence that can be cultivated within a healthcare system. And they're not giving that to us. They're not even offering it at all. Well, that's a real call to action, creating the conditions for women to be able to choose for themselves what they want and how to keep their children. Thank you so much, Obi Anuju. Thank you.